Good afternoon. Any questions? Yeah. Laziness. <laughs> no, it, basically what it came about is in GL4. Uh, Sure. Um, the idea is essentially that in GL3 and 4, you're doing a lot of things through shaders. So you actually pass it the, those matrices manually. For whatever reason, they decided, well, if you're going to pass me us the matrices, you might as well figure out what they are, which I don't agree with. You know, there's a lot of standard functionality that they could have provided that said, you know, it has to do with manipulating these matrices and, you know, do it in a standard way so that your OpenGL code is always portable across all of the environments. Um, basically, what they have, what the, the rationale seems to be is that just like OpenGL doesn't do sound, which is something that you want to do a lot, or it doesn't do printing, or any of those things, OpenGL says, okay, I'm gonna render that image really fast. And the setting up the transformation matrices to get to that step is something that you don't have to do. Or, or that OpenGL doesn't provide, so you know, it, it, it's, it's put on the user. Um, so there was sort of a movement, and I think at least the, one of the better efforts is called GLM, which is basically you know matrix multiplication or ma mo mo um, manipulation for OpenGL that provides a somewhat standard way of doing it. Um, but I, I, it's something that you need to do all the time. It's not something ancillary like sound. So I would have preferred that it just stay part of OpenGL, but you know. No, GLM is just a, a, a regular C library that allows you to manipulate those those matrices. Um, the the uh, in GL three and four, because you're basically talking about the shaders, uh, you pass it a four by four matrix, and then that four by four matrix then just becomes part of the transformations that we'll talk about at the end of the day. So you know, it, it's not a great rationale, but what can I say? Um, any other questions? So uh, just a couple of reminders. Of course, your first homework that you actually have to turn in something working this evening um, is uh, it's, it's due at midnight, but the grace period is until tomorrow morning. Uh, a few things that I want you to specifically pay attention to is Number one, make sure that you have a README in there and that your README tells me what I need to do, right? I know I need to compile your program. That's not, so you don't have to put those instructions in there. Um, but, you know, I need to know, to press the A key and then the Z key and then this wonderful thing will happen. Um, on that note though, don't make me work for it. Um, you know, when your program starts up, it should show the Lorenz attractor or show the scene. I don't need to, you know, play six levels of your game before I get to the Lorenz attractor, right? So make it make it easy on me to, to get there uh, right away. Uh, and then the things that I'm going to look for in this homework is basically three things. Number one um, is I have to have a way to actually manipulate the attractor, so to look at it from from all different angles. Um, I need to be able to change the parameters that go into the attractor. So it's basically S, B, and R. And of course, if you change those, the attractor completely changes. So um, that, needs, uh, that, that, that functionality needs to be in your program. Uh, and what I'm specifically going to look for is when I resize the window, um, your attractor doesn't, shouldn't re distort. So you need to make sure that uh, you deal with uh, that reshape in an appropriate way. Okay, so those are the main things. 
Other things is, please provide a make file that will work under Linux. Um, I'm gonna grade this under Linux, so I need a working make file for Linux. Um, number two, when the program unzips on my machine, don't bury the code at a lower level. So I'm gonna unzip it in a particular directory, make the code unzip right there. Uh, on the Mac, if you just right click and say zip up this folder, it actually creates an additional folder. So I need to go one level down, which is kind of annoying. Um, so that, that's something that I, I want you to figure out how to do on the Mac uh, from the command line so it doesn't include that. And make sure that your uh, assignment is called homework two for tonight. So HW2, um, so that I can find your executable easily. I don't have to go look for it. Um, there's a bunch of you here, so it makes my life very difficult if I have to spend, you know, an extra minute on that homework um, to, to actually just do things like find find the executable and stuff like that. You'll figure there's 60 people in the class. If it takes me one minute longer for every person, that's an, an hour out of my life that I could have done something uh, more useful on. Um, let me see if there was anything else that I was wanted to mention. Um, the other things I talked about last week is um, uh, make sure that your code is clean, right? So I don't want to see 500 lines that are commented out and then six lines of actual code at the bottom. That's kind of annoying. So clean out that stuff, clean out dead variables and stuff like that so the program compiles cleanly uh, and put in appropriate remarks and, and comments and things like that as far as the, the code is concerned. Okay, so any questions regarding the homework tonight and what is expected? Okay, um, if you get uh, feedback on that homework and no grade, that means there was something wrong with it and you need to fix it. So uh, please check Moodle. Um, every semester we seem to have a new version of Moodle and it works differently and sometimes it sends you an email and sometimes it doesn't. So um, go and check uh, Moodle by you know the weekend to make sure that there isn't feedback and you either just missed the email or he didn't send it or something happened to it. Yes. Um, do you want us to zip into the what we submit the executable? Or will you just make No, because it most likely won't work on my machine, so I'm going to have to rebuild it, and I want to see the compiler. Okay, so anyway. just the raw source code. Just the source code and the make file. Make file and the readme. And the readme, of course, okay. yes. Okay, so any other questions uh, regarding the homeworks? Okay, so the homework for last week was of course the GEARS program. And so the question is, why were you seeing the things that you were seeing? So most people saw something like this. When the GEARS program starts up, it uh, takes a few seconds and then shows you a frame rate. In this case, it's about 14,000 frames per second. Um, if you make the picture bigger, that frame rate typically drops somewhat. Uh, and if you make it really small, then you can actually not see it anymore. Uh, that frame rate often goes up to, you know, some, some higher frame rate. And if you, depending on the, the operating system, if you actually minimize it, sometimes that frame rate goes to a ridiculous amount and sometimes it goes to zero, depends on um, your uh, window manager more than anything else. Um, the other thing that I asked you to do is also to look at, for example, if you were to turn these, these uh, gear sideways, run them like this, what does that do to the frame rate? Versus looking at it like this or, or whichever way. And then the other thing that you may observe, depending on what uh, operating system or, or hardware you have, you may see something like this, that
it's basically 60 frames per second, like that, or So why does it say 60.008 and not exactly 60? Body point division. Measurement error, right? I mean, I'm basically taking five seconds and counting how many frames happens, right? That's just measurement error, right? So anything within you know, a fraction of a percent of 60 is basically 60. Or if I make it smaller, then of course, you know, um, in this particular case, it'll stay pretty much 60 frames too, right? It's basically 60 frames, uh, 60 frames per second should be 300 frames in five seconds. So sometimes it's 301, sometimes 299. It just depends on how it works out. So what causes this behavior? So first of all, let's start with this. If I make the, the window bigger or smaller and my frame rate changes, what causes that? Well, what changes when I make the window bigger and smaller? Does the ver number of vertices that I'm drawing become larger or smaller? Well, it stays the same. Unless, for example, I do that. What happens when I do this to it? <clears throat> do I still draw the same number of vertices? Uh, the number of vertices you're drawing goes down, but you also have to calculate which ones are hidden at the bottom of the window. Right? Correct, right, you're clipping them, right? But if a polygon gets clipped, does that change the amount of effort that goes into drawing this window? Yes. Sure. I mean, if you <coughs> trivially decide this entire polygon is invisible, it's off the screen, it saves you a bunch of effort figuring out what is related to that polygon. In fact, as a general rule, the thing that kills your performance the most is the number of polygons that you have in the scene. If you have a high poly count, it's gonna negatively affect your frame rate, right? So to the extent that you can reduce the number of polygons that you need to draw, that's gonna speed up your program. So generally when you, you know, you're playing a game, you'll be astonished how few polygons actually goes up to making the individual objects and characters in the scene. Um, developers jump through all kinds of hoops to reduce that polygon count and, and does all kinds of ugly tricks to reduce that because that very significantly changes your frame rate. You also do things like, for example, try take space and divide it into something like an arc tree or at least quadrants and try to decide you know, I only can see this part of the class. I don't even have to go to all of the efforts of drawing this part of the class. If you can eliminate all of those objects and the polygons that are associated with them to begin with, it will really improve your frame rate, right? Because of course your frame rate is really what it's all about, right? The more complex a scene you wanna draw uh, at a re at, in a decent amount of time, um, that's basically just reflected in the frame rate. So the poly count makes a difference. In this case, what we're doing is we're drawing the entire set of gears all the time. The number of polygons stays the same and the number of vertices stays the same unless of course many of them get cut off at the bottom of the screen and that could improve the frame rate a little bit but um, as you can see from these observations, it really doesn't make that significant difference. So the question, of course, is why that is. Well, it all depends on where the bottleneck in your program is, right? So what needs to happen is basically can be divided in two general categories. The first category is drawing the polygons. So you need to clip those polygons, decide which vertices are visible, and then actually start to render those polygons. 
And then once you've figured out what happens at the vertex level, you need to then render the individual pixels that make up those polygons, right? So obviously, the, if I were to take the picture and look at it like this, for example, so there's actually, let me see if I can set it so that there's no clipping at all, right? The number of vertices that's drawn when the window looks like this versus the number of pixels that get drawn when the uh, uh, window looks like that, the number of vertices and the number of polygons remain the same, but the number of pixels that goes into rendering that scene differs dramatically, right? So how many vertices are there in this scene? Anybody have a, an idea? Well, you can go count them, but it's a few thousand, right? How many pixels are there in that scene? Million. million, right? It's roughly a thousand by a thousand, a million pixels. Mm -hmm. So when you, can, when you think about what it takes to actually render the individual pixels, the main thing that changes when you resize the window here is the number of pixels that are drawn. If you are running at you know, a frame rate here of several thousand, and you see a change in the, in the frame rate when you have more or fewer pixels to, drawn, to be drawn, then your program is limited by the effort that it takes to figure out what the color of each individual pixel is. If on the other hand, it stays roughly the same, um, then your pro the speed of your program is most likely uh, determined by all of the calculations that need to happen at the individual vertices. So what happens at the individual vertices? Well, for the most part, it's the lighting calculations. And OpenGL will do its best to accelerate um, those vertex calculations using the hardware that's available to it, but very often it's done in software. And so if it's done in software on the CPU, that obviously runs relatively slow. Uh, as far as the pixel calculations are concerned, on most modern hardware, that is actually done uh, in hardware, so on the GPU. And because it can be done on the GPU, it is typically run massively parallel. And as I mentioned last time, the, the advantage of the pixel calculations are that they're embarrassingly parallel. That figuring out the color of this pixel is completely independent of the pixel next to it. It's a function only of what happens at the vertices. And as a result, um, having a machine like this that has over a thousand cores to actually do those pixel calculations in parallel um, makes things um, you know, very much faster. Now, of course, there's all kinds of other factors that come into it. So for example, if I fire up my NVIDIA screen here um, and I look here at the thermal settings, you'll say that it actually keeps track of the internal temperature of the GPU. And then if you look at the power meter here, you can see that there's actually some significant scaling that happens as far as things like the GPU processor speed, the GPU memory speed, and all of those kinds of things are concerned. So on modern hardware, um, making a frame rate measurement uh, and then trying to reach a conclusion of that is significantly confounded by the fact that that GPU, um, the, the operating system that actually runs on your GPU um, tries to do all of these optimizations. So you'll see interesting changes in frame rates uh, just depending on how warm it gets and you know all of those kinds of other things. Uh, similarly, whether you run on battery versus running on um, AC power, um, you could very often see some significant changes to it. So that there's a lot of this kind of stuff that's happening behind the scene, but as long as you get your, have your laptop plugged into AC power um, and it doesn't overheat significantly, then you typically can reach some um, useful conclusions by taking your program, running it, resizing the windows and things like that, then observing what, that hap what happens to your frame rate and then saying, okay, well, it looks like I'm, you know, pixel limited, so I probably should improve my 
um, uh, pixel shaders, or I'm very much vertex limited, so I've probably got too many polygons in the scene, so can I reduce the number of polygons that I want to draw and, and things like that, uh, all of those uh, to improve your, your overall frame rate. Of course, the big challenge was, and especially for the people on the Mac, was to actually be able to see those changes because on many Macs, what people saw was exactly this, right? It was just 60 all the time. <coughs> Why was it 60 all the time? Well, there's this thing called V-Sync, which basically synchronizes the rate of display to the refresh rate of your monitor, right? So if the, mo the refresh rate of your monitor is you know, 72 hertz or 85 hertz or whatever it is, then you'll see that particular frame rate when you have V-Sync enabled. And in your settings, your display settings, so in my case here, there's my OpenGL settings, you'll see there's a, a button here that says Sync to V-Blank, and if I have that turned on, every time a program starts, it'll basically be V-Synced, and if it doesn't, um, if it's not set, then it won't be. So it's something that you typically can change in your display settings, or what you'll see I'm doing here is that as long as you have NVIDIA hardware, um, I basically just made this alias here, that if you set the variable underscore underscore gl underscore sync underscore two underscore v blank equals zero or one before you run the program, then the NVIDIA driver will use uh, vsync or not use vsync for this particular program. Um, and that's just at startup. Uh, in libraries that are a little bit more sophisticated than GLUT, uh, you can do that in software while your program is running. Um, GLUT isn't quite smart enough to, to handle that. Um, but so it's something that you can either set with your display settings uh, or here on the, on the screen. So, of course, the reason why you run it here at 60 hertz is that essentially what this does is it syncs the double buffering to the refresh of the monitor, right? So what happens is, right, there's, there's why it's called V-blank, or sometimes it's also called B -sync, beam sync. Where it came from is the old CRT monitors. You actually were scanning the screen from top to bottom, and then when you get to the, the bottom, you've got this thing called V-blank. So basically, it turned off the electron beam while it swept it up to the top left hand corner and then started rescanning. And so in that um, uh, return of the beam up to the top uh, was called V-blank. And so what OpenGL just did was, or, or other programs as well, is to use that terminology to say, well, while that happens is when I'm going to be doing the double buffering, where I'm gonna switch between the one image that I'm displaying and the other. Um, and so, uh, there's no image tearing involved, right? Because otherwise what would happen is the beam would be halfway down the page, you would swap the buffers, and then at that point it would draw a different scene for the rest of the, sea, of the, the, the page, and then you would see two different parts of the scene. So if, if you're running at a frame rate of 3,000 or 4,000 or something like that, in this, this width of the screen or the height of the screen, uh, you actually see parts of many different scenes, right? And typically, um, you really can't see the difference between one of those and the next. So the advantage of, of having B-blank on is essentially that it's a frame rate that's high enough that the motion appears smooth to the eye, that you really can't see the jagged motion. Um, but still fast enough that, or, or, or slow enough that there's a pause between having to refresh the screen for the first time and then have time to do other things and then go come back and, and draw it again. So if I were to run top, for example, on my machine, you'll see, oh, come on. You'll see that, 
right now, this is writing flat out, and years is using maybe 1.7% or 2% or thereabouts of the CPU. Whereas if I were to run it in this mode, um, it's basically using 100% CPU, right? Or actually of that thread, but still. Okay, so the question then would be, well, when would you ever run a program with vsync off? I would expect your, um, ref or your frame rate to be just below the refresh rate of your monitor. Explain. Um, basically, from what I was reading online, is that you're going to have to go at a multiple of, or I guess, a divisor of your um, refresh rate of your monitor. So if you're just below, it's going to have to throttle it down to 30. If you're at, say, your monitor refreshes at 60 frames per second, if you're at just below, you're going to have to throttle down to 30, because that's the most it can do. That's correct. So think about it this way. It's easier to think of it in terms of milliseconds, right? At 60 hertz, it takes about 16 or so milliseconds, right, between frames, right? So what if it takes 18 milliseconds to draw the screen or, or to refresh the, your image, right? So let's say you're synced up at the beginning. You go 18 milliseconds and you say, okay, it's now time to swap the screens, except you've just missed the V blank, right? You're about a millisecond late. What you would then have to do is wait 15 milliseconds before the next refresh can happen, right? So in that case, instead of having 60 hertz or 60 frames per second, you're basically down to 30. Now, 30, the user probably wouldn't notice, but, you know, the discerning gamer will. So um, basically what that will do is cut your frame rate effectively in half, and you will sell half as many games, right? <laughs> so how do you get around that? Well, if you turn VSync off, then basically it will say, okay, well, I've drawn this much of that, that scene, but then the rest of the scene is gonna be the new one, right? So there'll be a little bit of tearing, but for the most part, you know, at that point of in time, you're really pushing what this hardware is capable of doing. And so if you turn off the V-Sync, then you'll get maybe 50 frames per second effectively as opposed to 30, right? So th those are the circumstances where uh, V-Sync uh, will be off. Okay, so that was basically what I wanted you to figure out from the gears. Um, the long and the short of it is um, that what you want to do to get a decent frame rate, especially if you have less than stellar hardware, is really reduce the number of polygons that you, that you are drawing. Um, and then um, perhaps on your machine, you can run it at a slightly smaller screen size and you'll still have a decent frame rate. Uh, and then when I run it on my hardware, which has a pretty a decent uh, hardware, then you know I'll get a, a decent frame rate even if, if it's full screen. Um, one thing that's very important though is when you write your program, make sure that you figure out what the wall time is, right? If you look at the Gears program, whether it runs 60 frames per second or it runs thousands of frames per second, Notice that the gears turn at the same rate. That is very, very important in your programs, right? Make sure that you have some method by which you synchronize any animations with wall time. Um, there is a, a, a glut call that tells you the number of milliseconds that has elapsed since the beginning of the program. That's usually a good one to um, used to um, synchronize your, your events. Uh, one thing to absolutely avoid is to have an increment in your program anywhere that says, okay, just take whatever the state was at the last time and add you know, some constant. 
when you do that, then if you, I run it on my machine with a very high frame rate, um, things will probably a blur, be a blur uh, as opposed to you know, something that you do on your machine where you're running at say 60 hertz or something like that. So be very, very careful. Um, if, if you do that, you'll probably get a nasty gram for me that says, you know, the motion is just a blur on my machine, um, go, go fix it. Okay, so any questions about the GEARS program and those kind of things? Okay, so let's uh, go back to what we were talking about last time, which was basically drawing objects in 3D. So what I'm going to do here is use example eight to show you um, how I go about uh, drawing objects. And that's essentially your assignment for next week is um, go ahead and draw something that um, is a scene consisting of solid 3D objects. Basically the requirements for next week is that you need to draw uh, multiple objects. Some objects um, needs to be replicated. Um, so let's say you draw chairs you need to draw a generic chair object and then have multiple of those show up and you know they need to be different in terms of color and shape and so forth. Um, and we'll talk about how you do that generically. Um, but the key thing in that scene is gonna be that it be rendered correctly, right? Rendered correctly means that the parts I can't see are correctly removed um, and then that the, uh, um, when I resize the screen, still everything is shown uh, correctly. So uh, here's a few uh, objects and how I draw them. So the first ones here, of course, are the cubes. You've seen that last week, so there's really nothing uh, new there. But what I'm gonna draw next then is some spheres. Now, of course, spheres are different than cubes in the sense that it's a curved surface, right? How do you draw a curved surface? Yes. Uh, quick question, is an actual curve or is it still considered a polygon where it has just really small vertexes? Can you tell? Visually, no, but uh, that's mathematically. That's the key, right? I'm gonna draw flat polygons, right? Because that's the only thing we can draw in, in, in OpenGL. But we're gonna make it look like it is curved. I'll talk about how we do that here in a minute. So obviously the spheres here, um, if I were to not color them differently, would be very difficult to see that they are actually spheres. So I've just uh, assigned some colors to that. Um, and, and I'll talk about that here in a minute. Uh, then we're gonna draw some airplanes because I like airplanes. Um, so we're gonna start with just an outline of just a, a very basic flat airplane. Uh, and then I'm going to fill in that airplane, right? So basically, instead of drawing the outline, uh, I'm just gonna draw the, the, the airplane solids, right? So basically what we have is um, the exact same thing uh, in this particular outline as opposed to that one. Maybe not. So what I'm doing here is I'm drawing a polygon, right? Starting up here and going around the airplane and just drawing the outline. And then I'm passing OpenGL a set of points and say, here's a polygon, fill it. And it didn't work. Any guesses as to why it didn't work? <coughs> Not time dex. Say again? Not time dex. Who cares? OpenGL cares, <laughs> right? Uh, one of the things that I sort of skipped over last time is that when you actually draw a polygon in OpenGL, and, and basically DirectX as well, um, 
what OpenGL does is to convert that polygon into a set of triangles. There is a very simple algorithm that says, if I have a polygon, I can change the, uh, that polygon into a set of triangles that is a perfect tessellation, right? That the triangles that make up this polygon exactly covers the original polygon without any overlap as long as the original polygon is convex. This is not a convex polygon, right? And because of the advantage of having that very simple algorithm to get this perfect tessellation uh, using triangles, OpenGL sets as a requirement that all of the polygons that you render must be convex. It doesn't enforce that the, the polygons are convex, but if you were to choose to give it a non-convex polygon, it is free to screw it up any way it wants. Right, so here's an example of what goes wrong. So what we will need to do is then correct that so that um, the, the polygon is properly rendered uh, once we um, uh, you know, convert it into uh, individual triangles. So that's the first step there. Uh, then what I'm going to do is I'm gonna correct that. So I'm gonna actually draw a, a set of convex polygons. I'm gonna make uh, these uh, flight of four airplanes, but they're all still flat airplanes, right? So obviously that's not very interesting. What we really want to do is have these uh, solid 3D airplanes. So parts of it is still two-dimensional, like the wings and the, and the tail. Uh, it's a really fast airplane, so the wind is really thin. Um, but you know, how, how do we do that? I'll talk about that in, here in a minute. And then finally, just putting this all together, um, you know, drawing a scene, right? This is what I want you to do uh, for next week is draw a scene with a bunch of things in it. Um, how, how do you go about doing that? Okay, so let's back up to the beginning and start, I keep on going to the wrong computer. Look at example eight and see how we actually draw all of these objects. So in example eight, there's a few things that I need to point out here at the top. Uh, first of all, please make sure that in your code you include all of the libraries that I need. Um, there are some inconsistencies <coughs> between the different operating systems as to what additional libraries uh, or header files some things pull in. So uh, please make sure that you test your program, um, preferably up in CSL or some win Windows or a Linux machine, or if you're on a Linux, test it on a Windows machine and make sure that all of the things that you're gonna be using is actually defined up here uh, so that you don't have uh, problems with undefined uh, functions or at least you know, where there's implicit definition of the functions. Um, then for OpenGL, um, the GLEXD prototypes, make sure that all of the functions are uh, defined. And then this if def here is what deals with the fact that on Apple machines, um, the GLUT library lives in a different place than it does on Windows and Linux. So make sure that you have an appropriate if def in here that it'll, it'll do that switching uh, back and forth. Um, then down here at the bottom, make sure that you're in a display mode as for all of the hardware functionality that you need. So typically you're gonna need the Z buffer, so GL GLUT depth and you probably will use double buffering, so make sure that you ask for both of those. Uh, on your machine, there are some things that you will get by default that I may not get, so make sure that it's always there. And uh, specifically, this glut depth, um, if you rely on the depth buffer working, and it, you know, is a default on yours, and it has, it's not on mine, then your objects won't render correctly uh, next week, so uh, that's, that's uh, sort of an important thing. So going back to my display function here, you'll notice that I have this variable called mode that I'm going to use to decide what I'm gonna draw, right? So to start out here, I'm just gonna draw cubes and it calls the cube function that I showed you last week. There's nothing new there. Uh, if you look at my cube function that I've specified here, uh, it's basically the same ones as from last week. So I'm not gonna go over that again, but basically um, that draws the cube. 
So moving on to the next element here is the sphere. Now to come back to the question he asked, how do we actually draw a sphere? Well, obviously, we're going to have to make up the sphere from elements provided by OpenGL, right? And the only elements provided by OpenGL is triangle, quad, and polygon, right? So I'm going to use quad, right? A quad is just something that's sort of trapezoidal or something like that. So if I want to draw a sphere, what I could do is to say, well, why don't we think of it is there's the North Pole, there's the South Pole. Let's draw bands of longitude and bands of latitude. And that naturally makes quads, right? So in order to draw the sphere, all I have to do is now go and figure out that's the quadrangle that I want to draw, draw it, right? How do I figure out the x, y, z coordinates of that point, that point, that point, and that point that makes up the sphere? Yes? Sines and cosines. Um, yes, lots of sines and cosines. But really <laughs> what we're doing is we're thinking of those in spherical coordinates, right? Because the sphere is very easily described in terms of azimuth and elevation or latitude and longitude, whatever you want to call it, right? So what I really want is a convenience function so that I can specify those coordinates on the sphere in terms of angles and then use the sines and cosines to figure out what that is in X, Y, Z or Cartesian coordinates, right? Why don't I just do it in uh, spherical coordinates in OpenGL to begin with? Of course, they don't got it, right? Right? OpenGL only supports um, Cartesian coordinates. So what I'm going to do in this case, and what, I lost my C code. What happened to it? Oh, there it is. Is to define this convenience function called vertex, where notice there's no GL in front of it, right? Where I give it an angle, th and ph, which is basically uh, latitude and longitude, and then convert that to um, Cartesian coordinates as the set of sines and cosines. And if you go and look at your math text, you'll figure out that that's how you convert, um, you know, azimuth and elevation or latitude and longitude into x, y, z uh, for a sphere. So when I want to now draw this, yeah. What is th and ph stand for when you use it? Oh, theta and phi. Oh, okay. Yeah, I, and I come from the Fortran world, so variables longer than one yeah. uh, character is just anathema. You know, you, it should be really one character. This is my um, consolation here. Is I'll, I'll use two, two letters for my variable names. So what I'm basically going to do here is to draw those latitude bands here um, I'll start with uh, pH um, here, which is basically my latitude and my longitude, and I'll draw these quad strips, right? So what I'm going to do is um, start over here, let's say, and go from that point to that point to that point to that point and draw that quad and then that quad and then that quad and that quad. However, I'm going to actually use the quad strip function so that I can only spec I only need to specify that point, that point, this point, that point, this point, that point, this point, that point, and so forth, marching around, and OpenGL will go in and fill in you know the first four 
the next four, the next four, the next four, and the next four, and so forth going around, right? So each time I just call GL vertex. Um, but I actually just remembered uh, there's a problem at the poles, isn't there? Be triangles. Right, those need to be triangles. <coughs> so basically what we need to do at the North Pole is to draw triangles like that and at the South Pole draw triangles like that, right? So that's actually what I do in this particular code is I do the South Pole and I call GL begin triangle fan. I give it the South Pole and then I walk around with all of the vertices. So I'm basically drawing a triangle fan. Now that's really a cone, isn't it? Can I do that? Isn't the triangle fan supposed to be a disc? No, oh, triangle fan is just a bunch of triangles, right? So there's nothing that says uh, all of those triangles have to be in the same plane. I can specify arbitrary x, y, z coordinates and say triangle fan, and it will draw a nice cone for me that represents the, the South Pole. So, wait a second. So I'm calling it with GL vertex zero minus 90, right? So that is the South Pole in degrees. The sine and cosine function in C doesn't work in degrees, right? It works in radians. <coughs> Why does this work? Are those not like the native like cosine and sine functions that you're using? Are there some like other <coughs> functions to do with sine? Is it or isn't it? Well, it wouldn't be the native one from the math. Why, Why not? Are those lowercase? Right, sine, C is, is case sensitive, right? So lowercase sine and sine with an uppercase S is two different functions. Where do I get sine with an uppercase S? Made it. Found the sine, yeah. I made a macro out of it, right? So up here, I, I define sine of x as being sine of x times the conversion from um, uh, degrees to radians, right? Multiply by pi and divide by 180, right? So by putting in these macros, when I call sine and cosine with an uppercase s and c, I can pass an argument in degrees. Very careful about that. If you pass it right, um, to the lowercase sign and cosine, <coughs> excuse me, uh, you'll get a, a very different result. Uh, and the reason I did that was everything in OpenGL, you specify angles and degrees. So I want to be consistent by using degrees everywhere. So uh, getting back to my sphere, there's the, the triangle fan that makes up the South Pole. There are the latitude bands, and then there's the North Pole. So, what is the pop and the push and the translate in the scale do for this equation? Well, notice that in this scene, there are three spheres, and they're at different locations and different sizes. My GL vertex function, how big is that sphere that I draw? Radius one. We'll have radius one, correct? So how do I make it bigger or smaller? I call GL scale RRR, right? So I draw a unit sphere and I just make it bigger and smaller. What does the translate do? It puts it where I want it, right? <coughs> and what does the push and the pop do? 
it basically isolates those transformations to just this function, right? So remember the way that the state machine works is that each of those transformation operations that I call adds to whatever the transformation matrix is, right? So if I make call, you know, draw a sphere that's uh, of radius a half, then obviously that R is value is a half. And if I don't undo that by calling pop matrix at the end, then all future spheres will be scaled by that a half, a half, a half, right? Or all future vertices. So the push and the pop basically isolate things to, to this particular function. Okay. Um, so, and the last thing that I need to point out here is notice that I have a constant in D here of five, right? So basically what that means is that that's gonna be my increment. So I start here, I go from zero to 360 degrees by five. So I'm basically doing five degree increments as I, as I go across. Um, I have a mistake in my code here, don't I? That should be th equals zero to th less than 360, right? That's how you do, do loops in C, right? Yes or no? Yes. Yes, how you, that's how we typically do, do loops in C. No, it's the wrong answer in this case. Why? You'll end up with a strip that's missing or you don't connect back. Right, I need to end up at where I started. So I need to be go zero, five, 10, 15, and go all the way around. And I need to stop at 360, not before 360, right? So I'm actually doing, if I were to do one degree increments, I'll actually do 361 because I need to wrap it all the way back. So be careful about that. Um, the where you end needs to be at 360, not right before. So um, that's true over here, <coughs> over here, and over there. Um, I'm using the same increment for both the uh, longitude and the latitude. That actually makes the cube or the, the um, rectangles that I'm drawing sort of tall and skinny, right? because there are 360 degrees going around this way, but from the North Pole to the South Pole, there's only 180 degrees, right? Because it's a, a, a revolution. So uh, if you wanted to, you could make them more square by using a different increment in the um, horizontal or the rotational basis than you do in the vertical basis. The question is, why five? Why not one? Polygon count? <coughs> right. If you have too many polygons, they'll take too long to render. Correct, right? If I go from one to five, by how many times do I increase the, well, if I go from five to one, by how many times do I increase the number of polygons? 25, right? It's five squared. That could make a difference, especially if my, my scene in, consists entirely of spheres. Why stop at five? Would 10 work? Yes. Would you believe 15? How about 30? What's the magic number? Has to be a, well, it has to be a factor of 360. Or well, it has to be an even divisor of actually 180, right? Because it's the, the yeah. smaller number, right? <laughs> um, so that's important, right? We need to make sure that whatever we put in completely finishes the sphere, uh, both from top to bottom and, and going around. But what's the magic number? heuristic at this point, what looks nice. What do you mean by a heuristic? You're gonna have to have some expert a user, or some algorithm determine what is what you consider a smooth sphere. 
So you could bound it by E and figure out the difference between the polygons to say that's smooth, or you could just draw it and look at it. I, I would go for the latter. What looks good, right? What works in your particular application, right? If it kills your frame rate to make it look really, really nice, well, then don't make it look really, really nice. You know, that's the compromise, right? We need to get a recent, decent frame rate, but still make it look good. You'll be surprised how low a poly count we can use, and it still looks relatively good. Let me change this from 5 to 15. Whoops, not 115. That wouldn't look good. So remember how that looks? Can you tell the difference? Probably not. How about making it 30? Mm. That's kind of a Susan B. Anthony sphere, right? <laughs> that, uh, I can start to look to see that. Uh, it doesn't look so good. So, oh, what? Example 15. Uh, that looks pretty good. I would think 15 is probably a good solution in, in my case, right? What if you basically were modeling thousands of these and they're all just this big? Well, in that case, 30 may be a fine answer, right? The only reason why 30 wasn't a good uh, uh, solution in my case was I'm drawing them relatively large, right? They're making up a fair chunk of the screen, and so I could start see the octagonal pattern when, when I started doing that. Okay, so long and the short of it is um, play with that and figure out what, whatever is appropriate, but be mindful of the polygon count and keep it as low as you can. So, um, is that the best way to do, to draw a polygon? I mean, a, a sphere. Well, here's another way of drawing it. <coughs> what am I doing here? Well, instead of doing the north and south pole caps, I'm just drawing a bunch of latitude bands and I go all the way from the top to the bottom. Can I do that? Well, clearly I can, right? What I did in that case is when I drew the, the north and the south poles, essentially what I did was this. So here's the north pole, just as an example. Sorry, I need to change the color. Do it again. Right? When I, were draw, when I was drawing the, the, the um, individual vertices, I was drawing that vertex, then this one, then that one, and then the fourth one is back at the origin. So I'm basically drawing a quad that's a triangle. Isn't that horribly inefficient? Well, a little bit. On the other hand, OpenGL is smart enough to know that when you take this quad and you break it into two triangles, you basically have one real triangle and one degenerate triangle, right? The degenerate triangle is basically one that has no area as, you, as you're viewing it. And so it can tell from that that, nah, I don't really have to draw that one. Now it is a little bit of extra work in the sense that OpenGL has to look at the triangle first and say, oh yeah, this is degenerate, so I don't actually have to render it. 
But what's the advantage? Well, from a software maintenance point of view, that is a heck of a lot easier to maintain than that, right? So what's the right answer? Well, it's one of those cases where there really isn't a black and white answer, right? If your main purpose here is that you want to write code that is nice and clean and is very easy to understand, that's clearly the way to go. But there is a little bit of a performance penalty. And if you are really frame limited and you're trying to squeeze the last you know, few cycles out of the CPU, then maybe you should do it. However, my favorite mantra is beware of premature optimization, right? What I would suggest is write the code simple first, make sure it works, make sure it's correct. And then if you really need to squeeze the last few frames out of it, then go back and see where you can squeeze that out and see if this is really your bottleneck. Um, so go for simple and clean uh, and maintainable over making it so complicated that you will never remember what the algorithm was when you come back to it in six months. Okay. So the last thing about the sphere, of course, is notice that in addition to actually figuring out X, Y, Z, it also sets a color, right? Reason why it needs to do that is I want the sphere, where did my sphere go? Did I close it? To look kind of like a beach ball, right? Does that really add much? Well, what if I were to just change this to, oops, sorry, I write too much Perl code. <coughs> Can I make it yellow? may be the ugliest sphere I've ever seen. <laughs> it's just a blob. Well, the bottom line is, for your homework for next week, be prepared to be disappointed. <laughs> You're going to draw this really cool object, and it's going to look like crap. <laughs> like that sphere. <coughs> Why? No shading. Well, the entire object is the same color, right? There's no subtle changes in the color. And in fact, what we'll talk about, not next week, but the week after, is that the way that we actually perceive the shape of objects is not so much just the color of the object, but those subtle changes in the color of the object. If you sort of look around at stuff that's curved, if you look at it closely, notice how the color changes as you go across the surface. That's actually how we perceive the shape of it. It's also how we perceive what the object is made of, right? Because a metallic curved object as opposed to like a natural curved object, they take my arm as an example, the way that the light changes over the surface is different. And so all of those little subtle hints are very important in trying to figure that out. So once we add lighting to the scene, which is basically two weeks from next week, um, it'll look a heck of a lot different. So for now, you know, make it cartoonish, right? Make this different surfaces of the object, different colors so that you can actually see differences in them. 
Um, and when you draw things like spheres, uh, do what I did here, which is just to, to, to make the, the color change so that you can actually sort of make out um, what, the, what the shape of that, that object is. Okay, so moving right along. Um, the next thing I'm going to talk about here is this little plane. So how do we draw uh, this, this airplane? So here is my polyplane. Um, and notice that I'm, what I'm doing here is I'm passing in a type, right? And that type is an integer. And I pass an integer to glbegin, right? Actually, that's an enum. However, because I actually properly defined all of my OpenGL functions, it'll cast that appropriately so that I can treat it as an integer. Um, and so what I'm going to be able to pass into this polyplane function um, from um, down here is either going to pass GL line loop or GL polygon, right? So depending on which one I, I pass in, um, it will either just outline those vertices or it will um, fill it as a polygon. And the, the specific vertices that I'm going to specify are going to be basically this set. So I'm going to start up front, go to the edge, go back to the wing, down to the back, up here, down like this, and like that, right? And because I'm drawing this in the x, y plane, all of the z values are zero, I can actually, in this particular case, just call GL vertex 2F and specify all of those, poly of those vertices just as two-dimensional vertices. I can make this 3F and make all of the Z values zero, but if you're drawing something that is naturally flat and in the XY plane, just use 2F. Then I'm gonna draw the tail, and of course I draw the, uh, this in yellow, I'm gonna draw the tail in red, and in that case, I'm just going to specify those, those uh, three points, but because these are now in uh, the, uh, actually in the XZ plane, I have to use uh, GL vertex 3F in that case to actually specify those, okay? Um, and it's rather a silly example, uh, but what I wanted to specifically demonstrate in this case is that uh, because it's not a convex polygon, it may look correct when you do the um, uh, flat plane, but when I do the, uh, the three-dimensional version, then or, or the, the the filled version, then it's it's not going to be rendered correctly. Okay, so if you see something like this happen, um, go check your code. You probably have uh, uh, some vertices in or, or polygons in there that's not convex. Of course, rather silly example. Let's try and look at some ones that uh, uh, make a little bit more sense. So in this case, I went to draw these points or these polygons so that they're all uh, convex. So the way I'm going to draw that is basically, first I'm gonna draw the fuselage. So I'm gonna draw that. And then I'm gonna draw the two <coughs> wings. And then finally, I'm gonna draw the tail, which will be basically that, right? So that's basically what I'm doing here. Um, these are just the flat planes. So I, first I draw the, the fuselage. This is a polygon because it has five points. So I specify those five points. Then I do the two wings, um, first starboard and then port. And um, notice the way that I've drawn these is the way that I've just showed you here is I've basically drawn this one like this and that one like that. Did anybody notice something about the way that I drew those polygons <coughs> that may be problematic? Say again? They're flat. Um, well, yeah, that's that's fine, but that's not problematic, right? Well, it, it may be problematic, but that's not what I'm after. Order matters. The order matters, right? I drew this one 
like that, which is clockwise. I drew this one like that, which is counterclockwise. Who cares? Open GL cares. Open GL cares, right? <laughs> if you were to use call face with these polygons, they are going to disappear at different times, right? And so if I'm looking at the airplane up above, one or the other of those wings are going to disappear. And so if I am not careful about the order in which I specify the points in those <coughs> polygons, then I can't use call, for call face. Do I need to use call face? No. No, I can use the Z buffer to make sure that all of these are rendered correctly. However, if I become frame limited, then I should probably be more careful, right? For this example, for this assignment, I would just recommend don't bother with call face. Just go ahead and um, use the Z buffer for these little Mickey Mouse problems. It's not going to make a difference and make it easier on yourself as far as the order in which you specify the polygons. Um, oops, sorry, that's not the one I wanted to go to. Um, and then, of course, the last thing here, uh, uh, both of these are ju I just do in two dimensions. Uh, and then the vertical uh, tail here would be, of course, the third dimension. Okay. Well, let's get to real 3D stuff, right? Let's get to the airplane itself. This is a 3D airplane. While it looks crappy because the fuselage is the same color blue everywhere, right? So you can't actually make out the four sides, but it is three-dimensional. So how do I draw that? Well, skip that magic up there. Let's get right to the drawing of it. So I call GL triangles. GL triangles expects what? Triplets of points that it will then turn into triangles, right? So I'm going to draw the nose cone, and I've used constants here to make my um, specification easier. And so essentially what I'm going to do is to draw this in three dimensions as <coughs> That triangle that makes up the top, this triangle that makes up the side, the triangle that makes up the far side, and the triangle that makes up the bottom, right? <coughs> I'm going to basically draw four triangles that make up that, um, that nose cone. Is there a different way that I could have done this? I could have done a triangle fan, actually. Fan. Or, or, well, either a fan or a, or a no, strip wouldn't work so much, but a I'm fan would, right? Because I can specify the nose cone and then just the points that come around the side and then basically draw on it as a, um, a triangle fan. Uh, would that have been more or less efficient than this? What's more readable? There isn't a black and white answer as far as that is concerned. So then the next thing I'm going to draw, of course, is the rest of the fuselage. So I'm going to just draw that as a square tube. So if you go through the code here, you'll see what I'm basically doing is just computing, completing this tube here, so drawing the four sides. And again, I'm following the same pattern as I did before. Basically, that's a horrible cute tube, but you know, it looks something like that basically do the four sides in the same way, uh, except in this particular instance, what I've done is to call GL quads, quads plural. Uh, but I again could have done this as a quad strip as well and it would have basically done the same thing. And then finally, this here plugs the tail. So there's one last quad here that is essentially that back plane. So those calls makes this, the fuselage of the airplane into a watertight tube, right? <clears throat> Very important. I don't want to be able to see through those cracks into the interior of the airplane. 
Then what I'm going to do is to add the wings. Notice that the wings are still polygons, right? I'm just drawing the left and the right as two very thin surfaces. So this sits out here and the other one up here on the other side. Do I need to make those three-dimensional, give them actual thickness? No, right? Whether that thing is, you know, this thick or this thick or infinitesimally thick, visually it makes no difference. So there is no reason to actually draw both the top and the, and the bottom surfaces separately. Do it like that, then if you try to look under the thing to disappear when you face it also. Well, so you can't use face culling when you do that, right? That's an important thing. Heads up, it'll do funny things when you do lighting. And when you apply textures to it or draw something on top of the wing, right? So if you look at this F14, we've got the insignia at the top and it actually has camouflage at the top <coughs> and not on the bottom. If you wanted to represent that, this wouldn't work, right? So what would you have to do if you want to have those things different? Well, you'd have to draw two surfaces, right? What could possibly go wrong? Remember Z fighting, right? If you wanna draw a very thin surface, the problem with Z fighting is that if you can't resolve the top and the bottom in the Z buffer, then sometimes you're gonna see the top pixel and sometimes the bottom pixel. Rat. How do I solve that problem? Say again? Uh, no, that won't work. But you're halfway there. Can you come up with a new class of polygon that has two sides? Draw the flat surface twice and specify which one's on top of the other. How do you do that? Just calling it twice, <laughs> slightly apart. Actually, no. no. So I guess on the same idea, like use face calling, but then draw the planes right on top of each other, one facing this way and one facing the other way. You draw those two polygons, you draw the one this way and the other one that way, and you use face calling to draw only one of them, to eliminate the one face or the other. Right, then that polygon gets eliminated completely and you see the top part of the polygon or the bottom part of the polygon. Isn't that kind of a pain in the butt because now you have to draw all of the polygons in the scene one way around or the other way around. You can turn on face culling and turn it off at any time during your scene. So you can turn on face culling, draw those two polygons correctly, and then turn it back off again. And it only applies to those two polygons or you know, whenever you turn it on and off, right? So you can, you can basically selectively apply face culling to only the polygons that you want to have face culling applied to. Okay, so <coughs> that, um, the last part is just that we then, I'm going to the wrong screen. The last thing that we're gonna then draw is basically the tail, and here I'm gonna cheat. So if I actually take the tail cap off of this, I can kind of show you what I'm doing. Oops, sorry, one more. You actually look at the airplane. Can you see right here that the tail actually extends down into the, the fuselage box? <coughs> 
what's happening is when I'm drawing the tail, and I'll draw it in cross section here first, if that's the fuselage, the way that I'm drawing the tail is like that. Why? Well, my really <coughs> bad excuse was, well, I was too lazy to figure out the math to figure out where that intersection point is, right? Now, in this particular example, that's a really, really bad excuse. But there are many other cases where it's actually a very good excuse. Here's an example. Remember Thomas? <laughs> okay, so this is a really bad rendition of Thomas, but what I'm getting to is this part right here. The smokestack. How do you know when you draw the cylinder that is the water tank and the cylinder that is the smokestack, where those two meet. That's a very complex mating surface, right? It's sort of like a saddle. Well, there was a time when we made engineers figure that out, right? It was called uh, analytic geometry. How would you draw that in OpenGL. Start the bottom of it into the aviation engine. You draw a cylinder that represents the smokestack. Come on. That looks like this. What happened to, oh, did I, ch oh. I need to put this somewhere else so that I don't touch it accidentally. I draw a cylinder like that. Why won't it look as ugly as I have right here? You have Z buffering. I'll have Z buffering turned on, and the Z buffer will decide on a pixel by pixel basis what part of these two intersecting cylinders can I see, right? <coughs> so we use this whenever we have complex surfaces that we want to intersect. So let's say I want to draw an arm, right? I'm gonna approximate the arm as one cylinder, two cylinders, some ovaloid spherical thing and then some more cylinders that's the fingers. What's the problem right here? I've got two cylinders that are joining and I don't want to, if I bend <coughs> my arm, suddenly have a big hole so you can see up my arm, right? How do I solve that problem? Well, I take the two cylinders, basically join them at the elbow and just have them go inside each other. And I'll get a nice mating surface here where those two meet, okay? Anytime you have a complex surface like that, just make them stick into one, each other, into one another and let the Z buffer sort it out, okay? What's the downside of doing it that way? Well, not necessarily polygons, but there's a bunch of pixels that you need to draw that you never see, right? So don't go overboard and say, oh, I'm just gonna draw everything in the world and let the Z buffer sort it out, right? Um, but you, it, whenever you have to do that kind of thing, try to minimize the overlap so that um, it, it will just render correctly, okay? So it was a really bad excuse in this case, but I just wanted to show you what happens. So. If, for example, the what object is not watertight, those kinds of things will be visible. So we need to make sure that our objects are watertight, and then on top of that, it will, it will look correct. So the last thing that I want to show you here is just in, you'll see in all of my examples, what I've done is, oh, actually I left out an important part here. What's all this stuff here that I skipped over? 
Say again? Animating it? Uh, no, that's positioning it, okay. right? What I want to specify is a location, <coughs> a direction, and what is up, right? So that I can specify the orientation of the airplane, not in terms of rotation angles, but in terms of vectors. So what's all this stuff here? While I'm setting up that transformation matrix that will say I'm going to move the x-axis to the x to y to z, I'm going to move the y-axis to u x u y u z, and I'm going to make the z matrix or axis the cross product of those. In this case, I am relying on the user to give me two orthogonal vectors, and I will ensure here that they are unit length, but that's all I'm doing. I'm not orthogonalizing them. And then I'm calculating the cross product between those. And then I'm constructing this matrix. What's funny about this matrix? Look at how the indexes go. The indexes goes 0, 4, 8, 12, 1, 5, 9, 13. It's a column matrix, a column major order matrix, right? That is because OpenGL matrices are column major order. So I'm making the first column the x0 vector, that's the y vector, one vector, the two vector, and then just padding it with zeros and ones. And then in my header here, I call push matrix, as I've always done. I've called translate to put the airplane where I want it. But then instead of calling rotate, I call malt matrix with that matrix, right? So that is a rotation matrix that I've created that then takes the place of the rotation. And that's why in this particular example, I can make the airplane fly around in a circle. Okay, so whenever that's appropriate, that's a good technique to, to point the airplane in the right direction. Otherwise, you know, it's the usual push and pop and so forth around it. Um, finally, as I was going to say here, notice that in all of my objects, I actually say this is the X, Y, Z where that object needs to go. This is the orientation that I want of that object, and this is the size that I want in that object. When I built these functions, I thought that would be convenient in my code to do things that way. But it's not the only way to do it. The other way that you can do it is the way that the teapot is done, right? So in this case, notice that I've got this teapot over here. It happens to be the glut solid teapot. It's a function that you are not allowed to use for your homework. You can't use any of the glut or glue functions to actually render objects. I'm simply using it here as an example of an alternative way of specifying the orientation of the objects. So the glut solid teapot takes a single parameter, which is the size of the teapot. How do I then make it rotate and change its color? Well, I rely on the state machine, right? So what I do here in my function is when I call the cube, the sphere, or the solid plane, I pass the parameters that actually sets it at the location and the size and the color that I want. But for the teapot, what I do is I call push matrix and pop matrix to set and reset the transformations. I call translate, rotate, and color to, in the state machine, set whatever the state is. And then I just generically call this function and say, go do it. So which is the best way of doing it? Do I write objects that are just generic, takes as few parameters as possible, and then I will manually manipulate the state machine to get the effects that I want? Or do I pass it to the functions that actually construct these objects as parameters? Well, that's a design decision that you have to make when you build your code, is do I want to pass a large number of parameters that sets everything about that object that I know? Or do I rely on the state machine to set that? Okay, you'll have to make that decision for yourself. Um, 
Finally, here, just draw the axes. Drawing the axes is typically convenient. In this case, I can actually turn the axes on and off because if you're playing Doom, you know, there aren't axes in the middle of the world that shows you where you are, right? So you can turn those off and just have them as sort of a debugging tool. Um, in these cases, it really doesn't make a whole lot of difference. Okay, so that's what it's about as far as drawing objects is concerned. Uh, your assignment for next week, obviously, is, you know, go ahead and do so. Okay, so any questions about how you draw objects, stuff like that. Okay, so let's take a quick break. I have 6.32. Let's come back at 6.37 and we'll talk about projections.